You're listening to the Intrepid Radio Program with Scotty Roberts. Intelligent Talk. Well, happy Wednesday evening, folks. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to my program, the Intrepid Radio Program, right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. That's O-D-Y-S-Y-1 dot com. You can come over and listen to the audio stream there. Check out all the different outlets where you can hear this show. And you can check out the lineup at Odyssey. You'll find a 24-7 lineup of goodness of all the different programs they offer. So go check it out at the same time. If you're listening to the show now, you can join us in the simulcast in video over on my YouTube channel. And the best part of that video channel is that there is a live chat room. So you can go into the live chat room, join the other intrep heads, and uh, enjoy the show, add your two cents worth, talk to people over there. That's at youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. And at the same time while you're over there, you can subscribe, you can hit the little bell for notifications, and you can go down below and you can check out all the videos of this show from the day one that we launched. And so uh, go check it out, listen to the archives, have a good time, join the chat room. And folks, it's Wednesday of the week already. It's been a phenomenal day. We have nice weather up here in the great white north. Uh, I'm over in uh, western Wisconsin across the river from the eastern stretches of the Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area. And so we're finally getting nice weather up here. It's good to be out in the sun a little bit yesterday and today. Looking forward to it. Loving the spring. And in about four months, you're going to hear me complaining about how hot it is. And I wish we had a little snow on the ground. Well, actually not really. Uh, Snow is okay once in a while. It's not nice for four to five months in a row. So, there you go. That's my weather update for the day. How about that? If you uh, heard the show last night, tonight we're a little bit back to normal. Rocky and I did a live broadcast last night because we thought it would be a lot of fun. Had its technical uh, hiccups along the way. Most of them you didn't notice, except if you've come to the YouTube channel to look for the simulcast replay, it's going to be over on Rocky's channel right now because we had some tech problems right at the very beginning, almost right as the show launched, and we had to quick switch channels so we could get the show uh, actually playing last night, uh, over on at least in the simulcast. It played on Odyssey Radio as normal. So uh, if you want to see the archive to last night's show, check it out a little later when I get some time to put that up in the archives over on the YouTube and uh, last night's show got a little raucous. It started out, you know, pretty good. And uh, it uh, degraded in a good way. Now, I want to mention to some of you who might have some problems with the kind of comic flair that Rocky and I present. We get a little tired sometimes of being serious all the time. Uh, we had a very serious political talk radio show in uh, the Situation Room and the Intrepid uh, radio program, both uh, back a few years ago. And then Rocky and I joined forces and did a couple of shows. Then we were doing the Situation Room. I get pretty serious over here with some of the topics that I deal with. And sometimes you got to have a little comic release and relief. And uh, that's a little bit of what we did last night. So those of you who normally watch uh, the Intrepid radio program or listen to it and uh, don't normally hear how Rocky and I do over on the Situation Room, you got a little taste of it last night. So I thought it might be a good idea today to talk about what actually makes good comedy or a good sense of humor. When we're surrounded by politics and very divisive politics all the time, and we talk about that, even many of you will say, I'm so glad you don't do politics on this show. 
Now, that doesn't mean I haven't hit it from time to time, but I pretty much steer away from doing politics here. There's a million other places you can go for that. I have my opinions and my take, and you hear them. Rocky and I do a lot of politics, but even then, we come to the point where we say, you know what, we've got a serious crisis in our country right now, worldwide. Everybody, every time I turn on the TV, every time I turn on the radio, every time I look at something on the internet, every time I check my social media, all I see is virus this, virus that, and so on. So we're all on lockdown, uh, supposedly. We're all trying to self-sequester. We see the seriousness of this. And by avoiding that stuff, it doesn't mean I'm ignoring it. It means I'm acknowledging the fact that there's lots of other places you get this information. Why don't we, my show, Rocky's show, our show together, why don't we just break from that a bit and offer up a little lightheartedness from time to time? My show, I get a little more serious than we are on Rocky's show because of the topics I deal with. So, you know, dealing with spirituality, dealing with religion, dealing with uh, self-psychology, all of the relationships, all that kind of stuff. Native American history, history in general. Those are all great topics. But I don't always want to be heavy-handed over here. And uh, so I wanted to let you know that there's some good psychology behind comedy and a sense of humor. And what makes a good sense of humor, at least from a psychological point of view? So let's dig in a little bit psychologically, maybe a little more serious, but serious about the topic of humor. The capacity to express or perceive what's funny, humor, is both a source of entertainment and a means of coping with difficult and awkward situations as well as stressful events. And although it prov provokes laughter, humor can be a serious business. And from its most lighthearted forms to its most absolutely absurd forms, which uh, we tend to do over in the Situation Room. Both of those. Humor can play a very instrumental role in forming social bonds, releasing tension, attracting a mate even. Did you know that? Did you know humor can be used to attract a mate? Uh, those of you out there who've written to me personally or responded to posts I've made and said, I don't have any of that. I don't have to worry about that. I don't have Maybe you're not humorous enough or comedic enough. So most important, though, humor is largely subjective. A universal theory is a good humor should be unexpected and incongruent. Uh, things that don't belong together should appear funny when put together. However, not everything surprising can always be deemed funny. Tripping over a friend's foot is surprisingly but decidedly not funny, unless they fall really funny. Then, you know, I fall and my wife laughs. Then she helps me. Uh, you know, she uh, I was cutting a tomato once with a big, sharp butcher knife, slicing tomatoes. She came behind me and tapped my elbow and I cut my finger. I go, you made me cut my finger! And she laughed. But then she went and got me a Band-Aid. So, <laughs> another quirk about humor is that the very funniest among us are more open to experience, more curious in general, and they might even find a, that they even enjoy a higher-than-average IQ. Uh, the really, truly... It's like saying... The person who draws the best caricatures or cartoons of humans really understands human anatomy. And so I think, I think people who are the best comedic relief that you hear probably are people who also have a pretty good grip on humanity and other things in life other than humor. So there's a dark side to humor, however, when it's hostile or when it's antagonistic when it's degrading or it displays a sense of superiority, an attempt at humor can divide us rather than bring us closer together. Now, of course, the shortcomings and the imperfections of others and oneself, self-deprecating humor, have long been fodder for comedians and humorists all over the place. Uh, so when exactly a joke goes too far and ceases to be funny and why it is, why that happens is one of the many lingering questions about the psychology 
that is behind humor, senses of humor, comic flair. So what makes something funny? There's as many different functions and styles of humor as there are versions of the old joke. How many blank does it take to change a light bulb? I've told a hundred of those. You know, a couple of my best ones, by the way. How many Renaissance Festival and entertainers does it take to screw in a light bulb? None. Renaissance Festival entertainers screw in tents, not in light bulbs. <laughs> you know, and what was the other one? How many uh, HDD kids does it take to screw in a light bulb? Hey, let's go ride bikes. So, you know, it all depends on your audience and how they're going to take it. There's also as many variations on what comedians will say and do to provoke your laughter as there's different types of people who tend to laugh at specific types of jokes sometimes a sexually laden joke filled with with uh, innuendo is a big turnoff for some people sometimes it's some of the funniest shit that exists and so it all depends it's like the it's like the the f word um, there are people that find that extremely funny, depending on how it's used. And there are some people that find it extremely offensive uh, because they don't like that kind of language. Now, most people, you can say, hey, if you don't like that language, just move beyond it. Either shut it off or plug your ears or ignore it, whatever. But then there are those who are truly offended by it, those who find it extremely funny. And again, it's how it's used. If it's used as an expletive and every other word, excuse me, every other word. See, now that was funny. I just almost belched on air. Um, if it's used excessively and without merit, without a purpose, it becomes, to me even, old and obnoxious. And it's like, dude, come on, move on from the F word. Find a different adjective or adverb or verb or noun or personal pronoun. And so, um, Sarcasm, for example, it's a type of humor that's often hostile in nature, but it ultimately carries an underlying negativity. But comedians who use this strategy include guys like Bill Murray, uh, who's a fantastic comic, uh, Sarah Silverman, who I don't like personally, but she uses sarcasm. Sarcasm can be awfully funny if it's done right. Scientists have proposed competing explanations for why some things are funnier than other things. The act of violating expectations is central to more than one account of what makes a joke impactful. Culture, age, political orientation, sometimes religious orientation, uh, many other factors can play a role in whether a joke is successful or falls incredibly flat. Believe me, I've done both. I've told successful jokes. I've had, I've conducted myself with successful humor. I've also had some humor and jokes that fall completely flat. And you're like, hey, these are the jokes, folks. These are the jokes. So there's also the, the factor of why it's important to have a sense of humor. Uh, here's some facts about sense of humor and how it can affect everyday living. Uh, from home life to office life. Humor can be used to diffuse conflict. A well-timed quip in the middle of a heated argument can relieve tension. I already talked uh, last week when we were talking about relationship stuff. Uh, my wife and I sometimes, when we're just heated at each other, and believe me, it happens. Uh, when you get heated with someone, maybe one of the best ways to uh, diffuse the anger is to get fun. You know, my wife will sometimes tell a joke in the middle of being pissed at me and me at her, and it'll break the tension and we calm down. Uh, sometimes I do that. So uh, humor in the right times can break anger up. It can diffuse hostility. Um, I, I remember once, I was once, uh, I'm not like Rocky now, you know, I didn't do a hard time for murdering people. I don't even know if I was supposed to say that. I don't know if Rocky's murdered anybody or not. I'm just saying. Uh, but... <clears throat> I'll put it this way. I've only been in jail once, and I was arrested because a state trooper ran my plates while I was sitting at a stop sign and uh, found that I had something like an eight-year-old unpaid traffic violation, which amounted to, I even remember this, this is like 
16 years ago that this happened. But I think it was $137. And he arrested me, took me out of my car, cuffed me behind my back, put me in the car, took me, drove me all the way downtown Minneapolis, dropped me off there where I had to sit overnight before I could just pay my tab and go home. That's all. I didn't even have to appear before a judge. Um, it was just pay your fine. Uh, and this happened in the morning hours, like between 9 a.m. and noon. I got arrested. My girlfriend at the time, which wasn't rainy, uh, it's pre-rainy, uh, she came over and she had the money to pay me. I actually had several hundred dollars in my pocket. Could I use my own money to pay my bill? No. They made me sit in lockup. That's a, this is a totally another issue, and it's a serious issue. But I think it's an abuse of the lockup system, of jail system. They had to keep me overnight in order to get money from the state to cover keeping me. So uh, there you go. So I could have been in and out of there in 10 minutes. But no, I had to sit in there for almost 21 hours overnight waiting until my girlfriend could come down and pay the tab the next day. Couldn't happen the same day. And there I was. But the point of my story is I was in lockup and was with a bunch of guys. And they were all unruly and they were all fucked. And, you know, they were all swearing and all the stuff. And they're all asking each other, what are you in for? Well, I kept a guy. You know, who knows if they were just, you know, BSing with each other. But uh, then they look at me. I'm over there. I'm a, I'm a guy. I'm a, I was, this isn't a racist statement. I was the only white guy in the lockdown. Everybody else is bragging about all their stuff. And I'm still wearing a suit and tie. And I think they confiscated my tie and my belt because it had a buckle on it. And so I'm sitting there in a suit, open shirt. And the guys look at me and they go, one guy actually came up to me and goes, you my lawyer? And I go, dude, I'm in here with you. I said, I'm not your lawyer. I said, I could play one for you, though. I said, what are you in for? And that's a, I kept a guy, you know, for this and that. And I'm like, whatever. He goes, what are you in for? And I said, vehicular what did I say? Vehicular, um, um, a vehicular infraction. I told him. I said my weapon of choice. I said, and a ninety-five Ford Escort. And uh, so you know, and it got them all laughing. And so I was able to diffuse possible tension in there by inflicting a little humor. Now, of course, you know, I wasn't too afraid about anything, but sitting in there, it's like this is boring. I could be out of here. I got all these guys that are actually criminals that are in here with me that they've locked me in with. And so I diffused it with humor. It was fun for a couple of points in there anyway. So laughter might improve the immune system. Did you know that? Blood pressure, blood flow, stress, all of those things lessen when there's good humor and laughing. When you make people laugh. Not laughing because, ha, 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 I'm going to kill you and eat your brains. Not that kind of laughter, but uh, laughter, genuine laughter. People especially disengage, em uh, especially disengaged employees uh, laugh less during the work week when compared with the weekend. And so a fun work environment can reduce employee turnover and burnout. I know when I was a creative director and I had staffs of artists, I tried to make work fun. Make the atmosphere fun, because when you have fun, you can laugh and have a good time. We got more work done, especially creative people. And humor is a desired trait in leaders. A good leader can't be serious all the time. A good leader knows how to be comic. I got to tell you one thing about President Trump, I will say. Whether you like him or not, the man does have good comic timing, and he knows good humor. It's just you got so much TDS going on out there, and people that hate the president for one reason or another, uh, all of his humor is usually taken to be something else. So, you know what I mean, though. A good leader has to have good humor. And then there's man and woman humor. Gender plays a role in what people consider funny. How many times did we hear, you know, blonde jokes? You know, things like that. Uh, research indicates that men appreciate dark, aggressive satirical humor more than women do. 
And on an average, men are also more inclined to like humor that's overtly sexual in nature. Shocking. Think of guys like Andrew Dice Clay or Sasha Baron Cohen. Uh, Some of those comics, you know, sexual innuendo plays big in comedy. Women, meanwhile, may have more appreciation for sentimental comedy, prefer friendly humor, comedians who are relatable, and the ability to tell a good story. Like Ellen DeGeneres. Look at her. I love her comic flair. Uh, But I, I don't really ever hear her telling sexual jokes. She prefers a different kind of humor. Tina Fey is the same way. So men have long been regarded as the most prolific producers of comedy. However, this might be changing with the growing success of funny women, uh, Melissa McCarthy, Ali Wong, many others like that. And uh, so there can be humor in dark times. There's ways to make people laugh more. Um, (laughs) There's ways that leaders, especially those in companies, could help their employees laugh more. And there's a relationship between humor styles and personality types. And so humor is an important thing psychologically. And there's a lot, actually, that's written about this stuff. And I've got a few things pulled up here um, that can maybe help you in this area of good humor. Having a good humor, sense of humor, a good comic timing, all of this stuff. You can use your sense of humor to attract like-minded people, like-minded companions. Uh, You can use it as a great social radar when you're out there. And I always try to be funny. I don't try to be the joker in the room. I just try to use good humor the way you've seen me use certain types of humor even in this show. Uh, I like to be open. I like to let people know I'm unintimidated by anything or anybody. And I don't want to intimidate you. And hey, I can tell a good joke, you know, and uh, and I can have fun with you, you know, and stuff like that. So that's the way I like to approach it. It's that kind of attitude of confidence that you can put out. And so a big question, ask yourself, are you funny? Do people find you funny? You know, I've run into people that think they're funny. And it's really one of those times when you hear them trying to be funny where you go, "Mm, I don't, uh, that didn't play very well. Uh, Your timing's off and it's not really funny. I've heard comics that are not really good comics that have tried their hand at it and it's fallen flat because they're not funny people. Uh, And it doesn't mean you're a joker (laughs) all the time. It means that you have good sense of humor. Now, I don't mean funny people in the sense of having other people laugh at your expense. Uh, accompanied by pointing their finger, oh, look at what a joker that guy is, but rather intentionally funny. Do you try to be, do you think you're intentionally funny? And the question isn't as much straightforward as it might seem, uh, because our conception of exactly what a sense of humor is can be a pretty slippery slope. So, what's a good sense of humor? What comprises that? Uh, ask yourself, what makes something funny? What makes something, even in the midst of seriousness, inflict a little humor that lightens the seriousness of the other stuff going on around it? Having a sense of humor might mean having the ability to entertain other people by making them laugh. But it can also mean having a quick wit that's frequently employed to skewer other people with snide comments Or just being witty about a situation. You know those people, you know. I know people who are about as witty as a weak old dry loaf of cornbread. Uh, But then there are people who are witty. Man, they can crack it right off the top. And it makes you laugh. Uh, Some people might define the sense of humor as the ability to see humor in everyday life. Or as appreciating the cleverness of puns and other wordplay. Uh, They may think it entirely possible to possess a good sense of humor without ever having those around them become aware of it. I know those people, too. And so in any case, a sense of humor is a socially valued trait that almost all of us would prefer to have more rather than less of around us, akin to the way that we think about intelligence or good looks. We like to have intelligent people around, good-looking people around. 
Uh, and that's not saying anything about anybody else. Just saying it's it's the same kind of emotional reaction we have. And a person with an undeveloped sense of humor lacks a certain social skill that puts him or her at a severe disadvantage in the hurly-burly of everyday social life. And we'll get into this more because I'm right up against the clock when we come back. Sit tight. Hey, gang, thanks for staying on through that break. We're back. This is Scotty Roberts listening to the Intrepid Radio Program right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. That's O-D-Y-S-Y-1 dot com. And you can come over and join the simulcast on my video YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. Come on over and enjoy the chat room over there. That's the best part of the YouTube channel. Now, we left off and we are talking about sense of humor. What makes a good sense of humor in people? It's a valued trait. And almost all of us would prefer to have a better sense of humor ourselves or at least encounter people who have a good sense of humor. A person with an undeveloped sense of humor lacks a social skill that puts him or her at a severe disadvantage in everyday life and everyday situations. You know, I've taught... I've told what I think is premier comic sense of humor uh, out in social settings and somebody doesn't get it. And you're just like, mm. you know, dude, where'd you develop your sense of humor in a car crash? Uh, so, you know, as undesirable as a sense of humor, might, uh, as desirable as a sense of humor might be, philosophers and psychologists have long struggled to understand exactly what it is or if it even really exists. So what have the experts believed about humor? Freud thought of humor as an outlet for forbidden impulses. That's the purpose of humor, he said. Philosophers ranging from Aristotle to Descartes believed that we are amused by something when it makes us feel superior to other people. I disagree with that one. Sorry, Aristotle. Uh, psychologists A. Peter McGraw, Caleb Warren, to name a couple. You can look them up. They proposed a theory about the role-playing by benign violations in humor. In a nutshell, they believe that something is funny when it violates our expectations about how things ought to be. For example, when punchlines and jokes or pratfalls by competent, dignified people surprise us with events that we did not see coming, that is what they call a good sense of humor. The violation of social norms, taboos, are also out of the ordinary, and hence amusing to us, like when Rocky joked not long ago about uh, when we're talking about uh, the whole uh, 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 um, Holy Grail issue, just lightly touched on it, talking about, you know, Jesus had a daughter, they say. 
And Rocky says, ooh, he says, could you imagine? She says, I'd date, I'd date Jesus' daughter. He said, hell, I'd even bang Jesus' daughter. Wouldn't that be a great notch in your... And I go, dude, you can't say that. And uh, that sense of humor, it violates social norms. It violates taboo subjects. So to some people, that's very funny stuff. To other people, it's like, oh my God, I can't believe you said that. And so uh, the amusing thing to us, as long as they don't cross a line and become morally offensive or threatening in some way, is what these things are. Uh, We love the taboo types of humor. And even those who don't like taboo humor, they're secretly going to go, that was kind of funny. So there it is. Recent complaints by comedians about political sensitivities of college audiences and the ease with which people playfully teasing can turn into verbal aggression, a triggering physical violence, all of that stuff reminds us of how thin the ice is that we skate on when we uh, practice the art of having a sense of humor or even incorporating humor. Is humor then an evolved social skill? Uh, Evolutionary psychologists such as uh, Jeffrey Miller believe that humor, along with other creative abilities such as art and music, evolved as an honest signal of intelligence and genetic quality. And it really became a part of human nature through sexual selection as individuals successfully exploited their senses of humor to both compete for mates and to hang on to them after the initial romantic uh, infatuations fade. I I remember uh, Mrs. Stucci being on with Rocky and I one day for a couple of minutes. And we asked her, what is it that drew you to Rocky anyway? And she said, he made me laugh. And uh, that's very true and uh, amongst people. And so he made her laugh. And look, he's got a wife. He's had her, we've been married, what, almost 20 years, if not 20? And so after all... If one has the confidence to engage engage in self-deprecating humor, you know what that is? Making yourself look less by making jokes about yourself. And to do it cleverly enough, uh, you have so much quality in reserve that there's no danger of losing status by being the butt of a joke. And it's like saying, you know, can you be the butt of a joke if you make the best jokes about yourself? That's why, you know, you know, if you've got that, and for the most part, when people make jokes about me, I'm like, hey, you know, or I can laugh along with it. Uh, the value of such a skill in diffusing tense, aggressive situations and in managing alliances and friendships shouldn't be under- underestimated. So, we, we uh, I'd like to explore... There's a lot of information here, and I want to get into other aspects of this. But I'd like to explore the possible function of a sense of humor. And I've got a ton of information here I'm going to skip over. Uh, it, It might be a tool, almost like a radar, that one can use to quickly identify and select like minded friendships, companions from a crowd of strangers. Schmoozing with a bunch of new people at a cocktail party is an opportunity to engage in lighthearted banter. Now, honestly, I gotta ask, how many of you go to cocktail parties? Um, you know, that seems like cocktail parties for, you know, like Buffy and Jody, you know. Um, but but how many of you when you get into social gatherings? Uh try to win people over. You like to be lighthearted, you like to let people know I'm not just this serious serious stick in the mud here. I like to let you know I'm confident by the fact I've got a sense of humor. And other people are grateful when someone is skillful enough to turn a stiff and awkward situation into fun. Cracking jokes, making witty remarks, engaging in tongue-in-cheek observations about the social world can be like fishing for other minds that connect naturally with one's own mind. And I do that an awful lot. Who shares your political opinions? Who's sharp enough to pick up on subtle references? Who responds to a good-natured teasing with clever barbs that smack the ball right back into your side of the court? Boom! You've made connection there. 
In other words, humor can be a device for connecting people who are operating on the same wavelength. So, observing the performance of other people in such situations tips you off as to who you might like to get to know better and who might be best left behind, wallowing in indignation and blank stares, doze in the headlight, or, I can't believe he tells jokes like that. So, you know, avoid, you know, the klaxon sounds in your ear. And so, in short, a sense of humor is kind of like a Swiss army knife of social skills. It might indeed be a single instrument, but it contains an arsenal of tools. Each one is exquisitely designed for some unique social purpose. And so, you know, this whole thing of sense of humor can serve as a real good, a really good social radar as you try to get to know other people. And when you're thinking of sense of humor, you got to look at it. It's, it's not really a laughing matter when it comes to psychology. Get some of this stuff. In 1957, that's three years before I was even born, the BBC aired a short documentary about mild winter leading into a bumper of Swiss spaghetti crop in the town of Ticino. Now, in a dry, distinguished tone, BBC broadcaster Richard Dimbley narrates how even in the last few weeks of March, the spaghetti farmers worry about a late frost, which might not destroy the pasta crop, but could damage the flavor and hurt prices. And the narration accompanies this film footage of a rural family harvesting long spaghetti noodles from spaghetti trees and laying them out to dry in the warm alpine sun. Now, naturally, Hundreds of people who called the BBC asking where they could get their own spaghetti bushes hadn't noticed the air date of the news clip, April 1st. And so the prank, which is, by the way, that's what today is. You know, with all the crisis going on, I even forgot it was April Fool's Day. But the prank was so successful that even some BBC staff were taken in, leading to some criticism about using a serious news show for an April Fool's Day joke. See, those are people what we used to call with sticks up their behinds. Um, They can't uh, take a joke. They don't understand humor and so on. So why April 1st became a holiday devoted to pranks and laughter still remains a bit of a mystery. Although some historians trace it back to the Roman holiday of, get this, Hilaria. Humans start developing a sense of humor as early as six weeks old. When babies begin to laugh and smile in response to stimuli. And a laughter, it's universal across human cultures. And even even exists in some form in rats, in chimps, in bonobos. Believe it or not, I've even seen my dog smile. Do they get humor? I don't know. But like other human emotions and expressions, laughter and humor provide psychological scientists with rich resources for studying human psychology, ranging from the development of underpinnings of language to the neuroscience of social perception. And so there's a hidden psychological language of laughter. Theories focusing on the evolution of laughter point to it as an important adaptation for social communication. Studies have shown that people are more likely to laugh in response to a video clip with canned laughter than to one without a laugh track. This is why you saw so so many sitcoms with no audience, but they have the fake laugh tracks going. Uh, They're using them less and less nowadays, but they used to do it all the time, 60s and 70s. Uh, And people that are 30 times more likely to laugh in the presence of others than while sitting alone. So the necessary stimulus for laughter isn't a joke. But another person, and now this is written by laughter expert and APS fellow Robert P. Uh, Provine, uh, professor emeritus at the University of Maryland, blah, 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 Baltimore County. Um, he says the necessary stimulus for laughter isn't a joke, but, but another person. So just look at canned laughter in TV sitcoms as an example, which I just mentioned. Laugh track. 
has been a standard part of comedy for almost since the birth of television. CBS sound engineer Charlie Douglas hated dealing with the inappropriate laughter of live audiences. So in 1950, we're talking 70 years ago, he started recording his own laugh tracks. And these early laugh tracks were intended to help people sitting at home feel like they were in a more social situation, such as fitting the crowded theater. And so Douglas even recorded varying types of laughter, including big laughs, guffaws, small chuckles, as well as different mixtures of laughter from men, women, and children. And uh, um, in doing so, Douglas picked up on one of the qualities of laughter that's now interesting researchers the most. A simple ha-ha-ha communicates an incredible amount of socially relevant information. For example, a massive international study conducted in 2016 found that across the globe, people are able to pick up on the same subtle social cues from laughter. Samples of laughter were collected from pairs of English-speaking college students, some friends, some strangers, recorded in a lab at the University of California, Santa Cruz. An integrative team made up of more than 30 psychological scientists, anthropologists, biologists, then played audio snippets of this laughter to 966 listeners from 24 diverse societies spanning six continents. How would you like to be part of that study? Or the money going out for that study? Uh, from indigenous tribes, tribal peoples in New Guinea, to urban working class people in large cities in India and Europe and America. Uh, participants were then asked whether they thought the two people laughing were friends or strangers. <clears throat> On average, the results were remarkably consistent across all 24 cultures. People's guesses about the relationship between the laughters were correct approximately 60% of the time. So I don't see 60% as being a great number. Uh, unless you give me 60 bucks instead of 40 bucks out of 100. Then it's a greater number. But um, 60% of people. And they were consistent in their responses. Researchers also found that different types of laughter can serve as codes to complex human social hierarchies. Across the course of two experiments, a team of psychological scientists that were led by uh, Christopher Ovals of the University of California, San Diego, found that a high-status individuals had different laughs than low-status low individuals. A stranger's judgments of an individual's social status were influenced by the dominant or submissive quality of the person's laughter. In other words, you know, rich people laugh differently than poor people. Might laugh at the same thing, but they laugh differently. So laughing in the presence of others indicates the interaction is safe, psychologically speaking. The researchers explain it this way. While the norms of most social groups prevent direct, unambigu unambiguous acts of aggression and dominance, the use of laughter may free individuals to display dominance because laughter renders the act less serious. It's like, look at black comedies. When you watch a movie and somebody is horrendously murdered by the, the, uh, the antagonist of the film. But the film has black comedy. It's meant to be kind of comic. And you like laugh when the bad guys die heinous deaths. Uh, and I'm not talking a serious movie. I'm talking a more you know, lighthearted black comedy. And so, <clears throat> you know what a black comedy is. It's not a racial thing. It's dark humor is what that means. So in the first study, the researchers wanted to know whether high and low status individuals actually do laugh differently. And to test this, 48 male college students were randomly assigned to groups of four, with each group composed of two low status members, that's pledges who had just joined a fraternity a month earlier, and two high status members, older students who'd been active in the fraternity for at least two years. Laughter was recorded on video as the group members engaged in a teasing task. Each member of the group took a turn in the hot seat, receiving a light teasing from his peers, a little roasting. 
and the teasers came up with a nickname based on randomly generated sets of initials. E.G. L.I. became Loser Idiot. Uh, and then told jokes, uh, 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 then told joking stories about why they chose the nickname. Now, one of the team codes, naive to the study hypothesis, identified all of the instances of laughter in the video. And a second team of coders, also blind to the study hypothesis, watched the video and rated how submissive or dominant each laugh sounded using a scale of three definitely submissive uh, to definitely dominant. And laughs received an average rating of two or higher were classified as dominant, whereas laughs receiving an average of two or lower were classified as submissive. And so a third team of coders, who were also blind to the hypothesis, coded the audio of each laugh in specific sound characteristics. Loudness, pitch, range, uh, modulation, pitch modulation, airness, burst speed, uh, that are associated with uh, disinhibited behavior. And so if dominant laughs are, laughs are more disinhibited than submissive laughs, as we hypothesize, they should exhibit greater vocal intensity, more pitch range, more modulation, and greater burst speed. That's what uh, the, the researchers or the, the, um, the colleagues who were putting on this test explain. Now, the analysis revealed that, as predicted, high-status fraternity brothers produced more dominant laughs and fewer submissive laughs re relative to the low-status pledges. And dominant laughter was higher in pitch, it was louder, it was more variable in tone than submissive laughter. And in this regard, dominant laughter appears to share some of the feature, uh, researchers, features that researchers um, have identified in genuine compared with fake laughter. Greater irregularities in pitch, loudness, and faster bursts of sound. Now, previous research published in Psychological Science demonstrated that holding a position of power can influence the acoustic cues of our speech. The voices of individuals primed with high power roles tended to increase in pitch and were at the same time more monotone. Listeners who had no knowledge of the experiment were able to pick, on the, pick up on the vocal cues signaling status, and they correctly rated individuals in the high power group as being more powerful with a surprising degree of accuracy, about 72% of the time. And then findings from the Fraternity Brother experiment also showed that low status individuals were more likely to change their laughter based on their position of power or lack of. The plegees produced more dominant laughs when they were in the powerful roles of the teasers. High-status individuals, on the other hand, maintain a consistent pattern of dominant laughter throughout the teasing game, regardless of whether they were doing the teasing or being teased themselves. So in another study, the research team tested out whether naive observers could detect an individual's social status based just on their laughter and whether the types of laugh, dominant or submissive, could influence judgment of social status. Isn't that interesting now? Can you gauge social status? If you didn't know somebody and you heard them laugh, could you gauge their social status on the way they laughed? A group of 51 college students was randomly assigned to listen to a set of 20 of the laughs that were recorded from the fraternity brothers. Each participant listened to an equal number of dominant and submissive laughs from both high- and low-status individuals. Participants then estimated the social status of the laughter using a series of nine-point uh, rating cycles, uh, scales. And uh, indeed, laugher, laughers producing dominant laughs were perceived to be significantly higher in status than laughers producing submissive laughs. And this is particularly true for low-status individuals who were rated as significantly higher in status when displaying a dominant versus submissive laugh. And uh, thus, by strategically displaying more dominant laughter when the context allowed, 
Low status individuals might achieve higher status in the eyes of others. However, regardless of whether raiders heard a dominant or a submissive laugh from a high status individual, they rated that person as being relatively high in status. Now, it's unclear whether this was because high status laughs include characteristics that were not measured in a current study or whether high status fraternity brothers just didn't have very convincing low status laughs. So, that grand experiment, I, I brought that out to you to show how they have researched how laughing can determine social status. And so, now there's the, the too soon factor. Let's move on to that too soon. How many times have you heard people say, you, they tell a joke and it's kind of quiet and it goes, too soon? So when it comes to comedy... It's often a thin line between love and hate. Uh, what qualities make something funny or not is a question that philosophers have been attempting to answer for thousands of years. Remember, this goes back to Aristotle, even. For thousands of years. But a pair of psychological scientists have come up with a theory that explains why we might laugh in a dark joke about murder as well as a silly pun or a play on words. Psychological scientists Peter McGraw from the University of Colorado Boulder and Caleb Warren, the University of Arizona, propose that negativity is an intrinsic, intrinsic part of humor. You get that? Think of Rocky and me when we tell our jokes with each other and try to make ourselves and everybody else laugh. Dark humor, uh, negativity is a big part of humor. And that's without violating a norm or a rule of some kind. A joke just isn't funny in some cases. <clears throat> but violations can't stray too far. Otherwise, they become unappealing or even disgusting to some people. And they can be upsetting to others. So according to the researchers, uh, the benign violation theory, the BNT, the benign violation theory, a violation is humorous, when it breaks a rule or norm, but it's benign. Um, it's not cancerous. Uh, McGraw and Warren's Humor Research Lab. Uh, <laughs> by the way, McGraw and Warren's Humor Research Lab, the HRL, it, it stands for HURL, uh, has conducted several studies examining the exact criteria that cause us to perceive a comedic situation as benign or not. Along with the severity of the norm violation, severity of the norm violation, you can th think of some things. Put them in the chat room. Things that are violations of the norm um, or a sense of psychological distance from the violation by space, time, relationship, or imagination. That's a key ingredient for turning an otherwise unpleasant situation into a humorous one. For example... In a study published in Psychological Science, the researchers looked at the effect of psychological distance in terms of time, inspired by the classic Mark Twain humor, quote, humor is tragedy plus time. That's pretty much it. The research, research team investigated how the passage of time can influence one's perception of event as funny or painful. And I hate to say it, we're at the end of our time, and although humor has been found to help relieve stress, facilitate social relationships, the traditional view of task performance implies that individuals must concentrate all their efforts on their endeavors and should avoid such things as humor that may distract them from the accomplishment of their task goals. But we suggest that humor is not only enjoyable, but more importantly, it's energizing. And that's why we do what we do. We might talk about this some more tomorrow. So I hope you had a good time. I hope you can laugh at some of the stuff we do. We're almost over time, so i got to get out of here. We'll see you in 23 hours. Have a good night.